well known in the puppet community. I wrote um, Hira in the old days, uh, M Collective, and recently I've been working on a project called Coria. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and Slack and all the usual places. So I'll tell you a little bit about the problem that I'm, the problem space that I'm working in, and, and where this metadata problem is a, is a problem for me. Um, I work in a team that makes internal tooling for a large company. So this would be orchestration tools that other teams use to manage their machines. They're not my machines. I don't control the configuration management. They go on the machines. I don't design how those systems are built or anything like that. They come to us with a problem. They want to build large multi-node, multi-step workflows uh, that do things like take a pod of nodes or a cluster of nodes, upgrade them between fairly complex versions of software. Um, a particular workflow can take hundreds of steps, and those steps have to go through um, things like approval by management, there are SSO around, there are entitles about who can see what workflows, and these steps and, and workflows can touch any machines in any of our data centers and any combination you can wish. These workflows can run quick, something as simple as a one command on machines, or they could be multi-day long workflows. And of these, we run a million, million or more workflows a day, each consisting of many, many steps. And the machines that we manage are in the region of hundreds of thousands. I can't be particularly specific about it due to you know, the client stuff, but um, it's a very, very, very large estate of machines. The problems about the... the um, the scale is, is, is both about the amount of machines, but also the, the many different places we run the machines, in government, places like China, behind all kinds of different clouds and different networks and all kinds of crazy people. And so it's, a, it's an orchestration system as a service. And we, we look at our machines in terms of, ideally, your typical user is going to put a job at the top, and he just wants to have his stuff work and his things run. In reality, we're going to have to communicate these jobs down, downstream all the way down to nearest possible to the nodes where there's a highest chance of, of success of those orchestrations actually happening and then the results have to go up this, this structure again um, for, you know, for, for consolidation and for viewing, showing people progress of their, of their jobs. There are many different use, use cases for people who would interact with this orchestration system. So your typical user is going to want to run at the top. He will want to be able to, to manage any machine in any data center in any region. Um, then we have systems like monitoring, uh, systems like you know, regional failover between data centers between, in a region. Those automations inevitably are going to happen regionally in the middle tier. And then we have things like fleet management, continuous delivery, um, reaction to node state changes, and these kind of things. And this is high frequency, um, high amount of orchestrations happening down the bottom. Now, we don't want to have a situation where if, let's say, the Sydney data center is disconnected from the rest of our network due to network failures and so, that you can't do your day job and run these workflows. So in reality, our typical end user can log in anywhere along the street he will see the jobs as available to him. Automatically, he must only see data about the nodes as manageable from that point downwards. So there's no point in showing someone machines in South America when he's logged into the, um, you know, the, 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 the Asia cluster because he couldn't possibly manage those machines if they're disconnected. And so we build this system. Um, it runs hundreds of thousands of jobs. and. If you're orchestrating against machines, you obviously need to know things about those machines. Where are they? Um, what operating systems do they run? Uh, what clusters do they belong to? Which customer are they serving? And you know, all this kind of stuff. Now, if you think about the, the, the typical users that I showed in the previous slide, the information that you need for these really fast, really high frequency orchestrations, it needs to be very fresh. And if we take a job from the top where a typical end user runs a job, we transport it all the way down to the bottom and we run it there. So the need for fresh data is only at the edges. Regional, regional orchestrations, they don't need to have that fresh data because they, 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 no doesn't just move from one data center to the next. That doesn't happen that often. And the kind of things that you care about in that instance is 
my nodes are on this cluster down that way, it's not going to move to another data center, so I don't need it to be updated every five minutes. And likewise at the top, um, users don't care realistically that much for a five minute freshness of data, the system does, but the people don't. So this is lucky because um, it turns out if you have that many machines moving that much metadata every five minutes, it's, it's, it's not realistic. And so prior to the system that I'm describing, we were capable of doing for many types of machines metadata even once a day. Um, and that's just not enough. And so when we look at the, a particular node, um, when it boots up, we detect it as a fresh new node and we immediately replicate its data all the way up the tree. So everyone knows the moment there's a new manageable node. And that's good because um, you know, it, I may not need to know the data is fresh at the top where I'm an end user, but I should know that the node at least exists. And so the, the data replication system that we have developed and that I'm talking about, and that's, that's an open source system, um, has this awareness of different life cycle states of machines. So a brand new node, I replicate the data immediately. As a node is alive, is going through its life, it will publish metadata frequently, let's say five minutes. And the system understands that down the bottom I really care for fresh data, and so it will capture and store and make available metadata at that frequency. It will then sample that data up once a half an hour, take a sample of the stream of data, send it upwards. And once an hour, sample the data, send it upwards. And so using this method, I can manage both the, 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 you know, the, the inherent denial of service that the top is subjected to if all of the machines send data um, very frequently and, and manage the freshness of data and manage the fact that machines only need to orchestrate that goes below them. And we have, um, if I don't hear from a machine for 10 minutes, there's probably something wrong with it. If I don't hear for it for 20 minutes, it's dead. And I send a little um, notification saying, oh, this machine is aging out and it's dead. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, like a high level view of, of how we move the metadata. I'll talk in, 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 in the following slides what we actually do with the metadata, what is in there and so forth. But um, that, is the, that is the kind of environment in which, in which I'm talking about. And, the problem that I have to solve. Now, as the metadata move between these tiers, I also have different reasons for interacting with the metadata. Either I need to process it very, very, very quickly for continuous auditing, or just store it somewhere for other systems to use it, or even share it with other teams. Because as you can imagine, in, um, in large enterprises, these kinds of metadata is political gold. Um, if, you, if you're prepared to share this data with other teams, you can get lots of kudos for that and, and, and um, it carries a lot of weight in enterprises politically wise. And so the system that we want to build is towards making all those use cases possible. Um, we have a number of problems. Obviously there are many machines and so the data about the machines can be 100 kilobytes or um, you know, a megabyte big. We have from microservices, they are quite light on data. Metadata about the microservices is not that much. Um, all the way up to machines with several hundred CPUs and, and very large amount of volumes attached to them. So the metadata can be really, really large. Um, freshness matters. I really want to have fresh metadata, but I have the problem of just how much metadata there is. Uh, the stuff is all over the world. There's slow links, there's down links, there's links that are intermittent, or they just lose packets. Very difficult problems. Um, and ultimately, when I process this data, there are many different kinds of processes for the data. Some of them are effectively a tail minus F on the data, and they just do something that's very, very quick, very, very lightweight. Other stuff do quite heavy lifting on the data. If I want to, for instance, um, audit the shape of a certain cluster or a pod, or make sure that all my web servers aren't running on the same DOM zero or in the same availability zone, those calculations tend to be quite heavy. So there's there's very different kinds of processing that has to happen against this data. And solving those problems and making the data, the data available to those different methods of computation is a different problem. And what I will present with you is how stream processing tools allow you to solve those problems. And these stream processing tools are, are something that you will have seen mentioned in things like the Twitter event, the Twitter stream of tweets, those are, tend to be processed by um, 
stream processing, big data, IoT, these kinds of things. Um, but they're quite special. They are a lot like middleware. Um, I've been using middleware for decades, and I, ca I, I can safely say with, when I read the Kafka announcement, I was like, but you just made another middleware. What's the point? Okay. Then I kept reading, and it's like, wait, you made a middleware that's just very difficult to run. Whoa, what, what is the point of this? This problem has been solved. And it turns out they are not... They are, they are deceptively a lot like middleware, but they're not. They are a kind of store. They are based, built on, on technology called write-ahead logs. You know, if, you, if you run, for instance, a MySQL database with replication, that MySQL log file that is an ever-appended log file of data that the replication uses to move the data between MySQL instances, that's a write-ahead log. And so streams tend to be built around a write-ahead log. A write-ahead log has um, particular properties. You can only append to it. Uh, when you write to it, you tend to know you've written to it. They, they, they're designed for surety in writing to the stuff, so they, will be, they sync a lot to disks, all this kind of stuff. And there's a sequence, and they're ordered, and you cannot delete messages from the middle. You can delete at the end old messages, but you cannot delete new messages, you cannot delete messages in the middle. And that's very different from what middleware does with their kind of stores. In a middleware, if I'm publishing something to a fan art topic so that everyone in the room who subscribes to the message gets the message, I don't care if it's been delivered. It's gone. I just put it out there and I delete it from my memory. Um, if I have a queue in, in typical middleware, and it would be things like RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ or those kinds of tools, they do persist the message for a while, and they do have a concept of has the message been processed. But what they will do is they will put the message out there, and if any worker in the room has taken the message and processed it and acknowledged that the message has been processed, they delete it. So the message gets processed once. That is, that is how much middleware cares about. On middleware, then, it is quite difficult to build these kinds of systems where you have very different processing models of the data because you, you, you need to du duplicate the messages um, to consume them at different rates. Where stream, every message has an infinite ACK rate, an ACK state. And so if I subscribe to the stream and I say to it, give me messages from one hour and back, oh, sorry, and, and newer, um, I will get that, and it will remember what it's given to me, what I've acknowledged to having been seen, and it will, and, and, and for me, that'll be almost like a private instance of middleware. For another consumer, maybe it's a database, maybe it's an auditing system, or, for, or wants to do anything else with this data, they also have their own acknowledged states, and they can go at their own rate, and their own, own, own you know, pace through this data, and they get the same data that I had, but at their own pace. And the stream systems will keep ACK states for each of us. And so there's a near infinite amount of ACK states based on just how many consumers you have. Now, this is really good when you have to build these systems, like I said earlier on. We have to have auditing tools. We have to have very fast processing on messages. Some of it has to go into databases, et cetera, et cetera. So as a middleware tool, it's the kind of middleware where it solves those kinds of problems. Now, there's, there's, there's hundreds of these things. I could put slides full of logos. But what I'm showing with this is we have all of the major clouds represented. So you have Google Cloud, AWS, Azure. They all have stream processing systems that you can just buy from them off the shelf. Um, you pay user as a service. There are, of course, open source ones like Apache Kafka. And, and the Apache project, in fact, has quite a few. But Kafka is, I think, this is one I think most people know about. Um, and there's a little company called Nats, which makes something called Nats Streaming. I really like NAS streaming, and I'm one of the, the, the core um, maintainers of that project, so I'm maybe biased, but it's very, very easy to run. You just run one command, it takes almost no memory, and it gives you these capabilities. It's really, really nice, um, compared to something else that might need Zookeeper and all this kind of stuff. Um, but there's a, there's a huge selection of streaming processing technologies you can use, licensed by all different kinds of licenses, and you either run it yourself, or you can outsource it, all this kind of stuff. So, so there used to be a, a time where this was quite difficult to get into this space because they tend to be high CPU, difficult to run, high databases, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's become very, very easy. So there's something that, you know, that anyone can look at, not just people with large teams who can manage large infrastructures can look at these tools. So what metadata am I talking about? Um, 
we can we can say it's fat, and if you've if you've used pop it, you'll know what that is, or high or grains or you know all this kind of stuff. It is effectively just structured data that describes a node. Um, I would also consider certain events, maybe not a full event stream about a node or all monitoring events, but certainly ups and downs I do consider as metadata. Um, and also relationships. If I have a cluster of machines, they're going to use a storage system. They're going to have a database, and possibly many clusters will use the same database, and many, and, and many more clusters will use the same storage. And so those relationships between the nodes um, I consider all of those as metadata, and certainly for our system it does. Because if you're doing um, large orchestrations, you need to know what are all the related machines. And even if you just want to do operations like notify someone about plant maintenance, you need to know who all of the, all of the associated machines are. So metadata lets you do that. So it's something that, that every configuration management system use, almost every system management system um, allow you to create. And unfortunately, many of them will stick it into their own databases where it's kind of locked up. Um, and if they do it, that is you know, generically queryable, queryable like PuppetDB does, um, you can't really influence the, the way that the data arrives in those databases. And so inevitably, you, you, you can come up with your own, own ways to store these things if you build orchestration systems. Now, creating it is nominally very simple. You just run that command, and you have your metadata. It's, it's great. Um, Unfortunately, the, the devil is in the details because the information that we have about a node comes from many, many different places. So when the node gets made, the instance starts up, there's um, information that Terraform will associate with the machine. There's information that the cloud provides just because the machine exists and which availability zone is it, what kind of shape of machine it is, all this kind of stuff, those things that you get through that little um, web API. Your so CI, CD systems are continuously um, delivering new software to the systems. They may change some metadata about the machine. Regardless, you'll want to know which versions of software are on your machines. Um, and so those data that continuously change their metadata. Operations people are constantly, you know, they're moving machines, they're dealing with outages, they're upgrading machines, they're scaling the machines, adding memory, adding CPUs, whatever. Um, those things are metadata. Maybe you use, maybe you use, maybe you migrate the machine between different DOM zeros, or maybe you, you migrate within VMware clusters, or you know whatever. Those things change your relationships that your machines, the metadata um, relationships. Scale events. If I have a five-node cluster and it becomes a ten-node cluster. All the machines in that, in that cluster needs to become aware that they are now in a 10 node cluster. And that is more metadata about the machines. Likewise, as I mentioned, we, um, we manage other people's machines. And so they will have ancillary data, maybe in their CMDBs, that they also want to see expressed in our user interfaces to, for, for node selection and such. And so we have to query their databases. And at the end of the day, when the machine is decommissioned, you either shut it down completely, you should probably record the fact that it's shut down, or we have many cases where for, for regulatory reasons, we just leave them standing for months because they have whatever data on them or something. Um, and so you need to know not to um, orchestrate against decommissioned machines. So all of that data has to be queried, has to be consolidated, has to be updated. Some of it changes frequently, some of it almost never changes. Uh, some of it changes so infrequently that it's not worth querying it all the time. You have to have the metadata tell you almost that has changed or the subsystem has changed. And so normally it's a factory command. The details makes gathering rich metadata about a machine very difficult. And so we have a system that we deploy to the, to the machines to gather that data. I don't really care so much for that, for that detail, but the point is there's vast amounts of data that we gather about the machines in it, and it's, it's very different for every, for every offering of, that we support. So in our picture, um, the data is, is, is on the node, and we do have a local software that will query that data, and that will use all of the work we've done for consolidating and querying and, and creating all of those relationships um, on the node, but it's kind of useless just sitting on the node. And so, 
how do we how do we move the data from from there onwards? Um, now I make software called Corea, which is uh, which is uh, a messaging middleware kind of RPC framework um, system that for for operations problems. And so the Corea daemon that runs on every machine, it has the ability to take that metadata data and publishes it across the network to something called the Corea broker. Those messages. Well, I'll show you in the next slide. They're very simple. I put the time of the file and what particular file it is. Um, has it been updated since the last time I've seen it? And I compress the data that's in there. As part of the Corea networking infrastructure, though, those, this little packet will be signed by a certificate. Um, you couldn't modify it on the fly. Someone couldn't gather it, unpack it, modify the data, repack it, and send it into the network as, a, as a, you know, trying to somehow influence the metadata, maybe trying to join a machine onto a cluster they don't have the rights to join. Um, we, we serve government builds and all this kind of stuff, so we can't have that. Um, and so the open source Corea server will sign those node metadata package for you, polish them, and you can verify that they are what they say they are and from who they say they are. Once they're in the Corea broker, they're still not queryable. They're just metadata sitting in something's memory. Um, and within that Corea broker then sits the technology called adapters. And adapters allow me to take that data onto streams. And so it adapts the payload into a new format. And it protocol translates it from the one end that speaks NATS into maybe the NATS streaming or Kafka or Azure or AWS or wherever you need it. And this infrastructure that these, these adapting processes, obviously on the one end you have just a torrent of metadata. You don't know how many machines there are, but a vast amount of them. And on the other end you have machines that's software that's inherently a little bit slow because they will do you know, committed writes. And if you have a cluster of Kafka or NATs, um, it will make sure that your write happens to a quorum of members within that cluster. So it's going to be slower than the sending side inevitably. Um, So this um, technology, the adapters, it's stateless, it scales horizontally, it scales vertically. So you can, you can have many, many processes to shovel that data into your, into your streaming process network. And ultimately, it protects itself. So if there's just too much metadata, it will just drop it on the floor because the data will come again in five minutes time. Why should I care about every single one? Um, but that's a framework there for taking this, this, this just huge amount of data and sticking it into different kind of streaming processes. You can have in one Corea brokers multiple destinations or multiple types of destinations, etc. The data that it puts in the stream kind of depends on the, on, the, on the streaming technology, but it's going to be something along those lines. And so I have a unique ID, so the UUID. Um, I have the node data, and that would be verified by the certificate. So it's, it's not something that is user supplied effectively, it's, it's in the certificate. The certificate has to be signed by the CA that I belong to, etc. And then the data, um, compressed. Um, so this stuff sits on the stream. Now you can start consuming it. You can, you can read it into, into processing software that will save it into a database. And, and we would save it into a database. So, our metadata has made it onto, onto the regional network, and it keeps doing this every five, every five minutes. There, I will show some of the processes that we do later on, but we save it into a local database. We use that local database for discovery caches, for querying what machines are there, for discovering topologies of the network, um, for auditing purposes, all these kind of things. And it has to be up to date. And so, so this, this model will put it up to date every five minutes. Um, now, we then take the data from one NAT stream. I have a thing called the stream replicator in the Corea project, and it copies the data to another stream. In Kafka, there's a thing called Mirror Maker. I think most of these tools have, have equivalent um, software to this. The Corea stream replicator has a number of um, features that's, that's very, very slanted towards operations data, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But it's an it's a open source component that can, can copy data between two, two streams. And so what that gives us is it moves the data everywhere. Wherever I need a copy of the data, I can move it. And not shown here really is, but it supports that five minutes, half an hour, one hour kind of um, aging out of data. 
it supports notifying me when the machines haven't been receiving the, producing data or if maybe it's producing data but it just can't speak to me. So it has all of those capabilities built into it. And well, if I wanted to have a, a standby orchestrator, I simply send a copy of the data somewhere else. The data will be re reproduced every five minutes in any case, so I don't have to worry about backups or anything like that, and it's always up to date, it's great. Um, likewise, if I have another team in my, in my, in my um, company who really um, wants this data because such rich data that's aware of so many internals of so many different teams is just gold. Um, I can replicate them either regional overlay network, all of the data, whatever they want, on whatever age they want, I can give it to them once a day, a copy of the stuff. And it's all done with the same technology. So any, any point, any place where the data has to move from, from A to B, um, the same piece of technology can use that, can do that, facilitate it. And so the, the tool I have is called Corea Stream Replicator. Uh, it's, um, it's NATS streaming specific at this point. It can preserve order from one stream to the next. So if you, if, you, if you really need to have these things strictly ordered, it can do that for you. Um, in the case of metadata, we don't really care. So um, if, you want, if you don't want strict order preservation, it's vertically and horizontally scalable. We can run many copies of these things, and it, it just adds, adds to the performance of it. It supports this concept of age-based replication. So Every five minutes, every half an hour, every one hour, it supports all of that. Um, it's today specifically doing that streaming. Um, inside it, I have circuit breakers, I have health checking, um, huge amounts of observability data comes out of it. Um, for instance, if something goes wrong and we are sending bad data, uh, I mean it can happen. We don't want to. Rep we want. We don't want that data to go everywhere, or maybe. There's a bug and things start crashing. Um, I have the ability to do in one place log in and do a circuit break on all of the instances of the circuit, circuit of the stream replicator that runs, and so protect our network from bad data or from data that makes other components crash. Um, that it may not sound like a big deal, but if you if you're in in big enterprises, I mean. If I just have to log into one machine behind each one of my firewalls and Bastion nodes and SSH keys and UB keys and half of them will have expired, it will take me a day just to log into the machine. So um, having that, that ability to circuit break all of the stuff really, really quickly is um, quite important. And it, it speaks to others everywhere. It's an open source project, um, Apache license, and so you can, use, you can just use it to solve these problems. I will show some performance data just now of it. It's, um, YAML, YAML camp compliant, I guess, so it has a, it has a YAML config file. Um, and to make it scale horizontally, you just set how many workers you want. To make it scale vertically, you just set, put them all in the group, and you can start these things up on many different nodes. Um, and depending on your scale and your, and your messages you have to process, it scales in both directions. This thing where it ages out the machine, so only copy data based on certain, certain um, properties of the, of the message. It's very easy to configure. If you put JSON data over it, it will look at the, the JSON field called host, um, and it will cherry pick once an hour out of that stream and replicate it upwards. So it's very easy to, to achieve those things. This picking of, picking of messages and only replicating up um, once an hour really, really helps a lot. So here I have a graph. We have, what's that? Let me see. Uh, 2.5 megabytes per second of metadata at the top, and that would be my five-minute data for, for one, of the, one of the data centers. And then leaving that data center is only 500 kilobytes per second, on, roughly, on average. Um, and that's because it's only cherry-picking out once, I think it was maybe a half an hour or something like that. Um, so it, it will really help with the denial of service issues of large amount of data upwards and it, um, it really saves you bandwidth and all that kind of stuff. I don't think other replication tools that I've seen for other streams have this kind of capability, so it's, it's kind of unique to it, but um, if you don't need that, you can do the same of Kafka. Um, so it knows how many machines it has seen because if it's tracking 
when last it saw a particular machine's data an hour ago to replicate it. It also knows then what is the full estate that it's managing. And so I can detect when a machine goes down um, or if I haven't seen it for a while and it can warn me that the machine is maybe in trouble. And if I haven't seen the machine for say half an hour, um, I consider the machine dead. And um, next time I see it, I will consider it new so a fresh piece of metadata goes immediately. Um, the advisory that it sends looks like this. So when a machine is busy, this was a timeout, so it's not dead, dead yet. But it publishes these little messages upwards, and those will travel throughout the replication chain immediately. Um, and subsystems higher up that want to go, you know, like in our case, we are, we are offering people the ability to orchestrate their machines. And so we, we warn them that the machine is, you know, probably not manageable right now because we haven't heard from it for a while. And so those little small messages, events about the nodes go out. And, and it turns out that's, that's actually super helpful because large monitoring systems, not that great. Um, we know machines go down long before other teams. Um, so, so this is all kind of just a bit meta because I'm just moving data around the place and I'm not, not really doing anything with it yet. Um, but we process this data into, into many different cases. So, so for instance, for our, our, our local caches for discovery, we may want to use something like MongoDB. It's, you know, the data rebuilds itself every five minutes, so it's perfectly fine for that. Um, and its querying model is quite nice, and if you don't really know what the data looks like or the structure of the data, MongoDB is really nice for that. And so, so we use something like that down at the edge, and we have a, a discovery cache. And we use that to, to, even from within our CLIs, to know what machines are out there and audit RPC streams and these kind of things. Um, we will also store the data in a, in a more typical relationship, related, relation, relational database. Um, and those are wrapped around the data, an, a, a API with a REST interface and JWT tokens for access and so forth. And so other teams or other systems can query it there based on a, a standard structure. And also what you can do is, is real-time processing the stream to, to audit certain things, look for anomalies within the data, and all that kind of different, different uses for this information um, is facilitated by the data sitting in the stream and consuming the stream. So consuming a stream is really simple. Um, here's Ruby code, but they've, they've gone to quite a lot of length to make the APIs and different programming languages appear almost identical. Um, they all use the same terminology within the, within the client libraries, and it's very simple. What I'm doing here, I just require the client, um, I give it where the servers are, and it will file over between the servers and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I ask it to give me the metadata, and then I process each one as it comes in. It's a, um, what I do with the process call, of course, is, is where the details lie, but um, you have some interesting options when subscribing to this data. So in this case, if I say start at first, it's, it's just going to give me all the data. And um, as quick as I can take it. I will get a message. I will tell it I'm done with it. It will give me the next one. Um, I can start 10 copies of my software up, and it will happily share the information between those 10 copies. It will load share between. And if that one doesn't act it, eventually another one will handle it. Um, and that processing will be independent from other pieces of software processing and data. I can also say I started the last message received. So that's a tell minus F. I don't care for all the stuff that's come before. Just give me what I have. Um, or start an hour ago. So it has that time dimension where I can say, I want to view a moving data, a moving view of one hour of my, of my metadata changes. I can consume just an hour's worth of data um, as, a, as, a, as an event stream based on time. If I give it a, a, a name like that, I tell it who I am, it will remember me. And if I control C my software or if my software crash or if I'm upgrading my software or rebooting the machines, next time I come back, it will remember who I am. It will remember what is the last message it gave me and I will continue where I left off. And it handles that kind of tracking of who I am and what I've seen and acknowledge states um, all internally to the stream. So I don't have to do anything. I don't have to remember which messages I've seen or anything like that. It's just a free side effect of, of, of the stream. Um, and so 
these are quite you know quite basic basic primitives but they they're very 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 helpful for for dealing with this kind of ever updating data and you can see how if you're doing things like iot where you're getting temperatures from sensors or or power usage from wall plugs that kind of stuff is useful um and and likewise with machines and so these this this is why these these um systems are used there now we do a bunch of stuff with it. Like I said, we, we have stores and databases, we replicate them, we audit them. And I would, I would, you know, what I really enjoy most about it is because I can experiment with the data, even in production. The data is there. Me consuming the data that isn't going to interfere with anyone else, um, any other production system that's running. So I can start looking at this system and think, what kind of things do I want to build with the data that I have? And so, I have a little thingy that, that I write a rule like that, and I will explain to you what happens there. Um, and this piece of code lives effectively in the stream of data, and every time that there's a new piece of metadata published, the audit happens, or this code gets executed. And I can decide if I want to do that all the time, down every five minutes, or higher up once an hour, or once a day, or whatever I choose. So. I look for all my web servers, and if it's a web server, I do, I do this code. Um, I load from a database my related machines, so it's maybe difficult to guess what's happening there, but um, I look at what cluster I am belong to based on my state, and I load up all of the other web servers in that cluster. I also read up who are the DOM zeros of those web servers and how many related machines I have. I then look. I don't have any friend web servers, that's bad. So raise an error. Um, I have an even amount of, no, of web servers, that's pretty bad if, if you do something that requires a quorum. Um, and I do a quick check, you know, is my web servers evenly spread across my DOM zeros? Now that, that's, that's, a, that's a very difficult thing to do if you don't have metadata and even, even if you do, um, to do that continuously is, is really difficult. We, we, we did such a query on our estate and we found that mistake has been made a lot to the point where it's so money we could probably not fix it. But um, with this in place, we will immediately, the moment someone makes that mistake, we are notified that there's a machine or there's a cluster that's, that's deployed in such a way that it's not highly available. Um, these are stupid examples maybe, but uh, you, can, you can see how you could put any kind of logic in there. And when you have these rules that describes a healthy cluster, and you take those rules from the cluster owners, not maybe from, from us who are offering a service, <coughs> if I enable the cluster owners to write that, I can tell them the cluster is healthy or not, the shape of the cluster is healthy or not, without necessarily understanding what is inside their cluster because they provide the rules. And I can do things like a what-if scenario. What if I wanted to scale out my cluster for another web server? I'm not doing it now, but what if I want to do it? Um, I could run the same rules, and I can tell them there is no scenario where you can scale your infrastructure out today because you simply don't have enough DOM zeros. Or if you try to scale it out, it's just not going to work. Or um, you'll, you'll comp compromise the availability of your cluster. And and that is you know, super helpful because you can let people know they need to buy more stuff, which is great, if, if you sell them things. Um, or just from an operational point of view, it's, um, it's very useful data to have. And so we have these streams, and, and I, we started off just shifting metadata over it. And over time, it's, um, it's become really, really useful. I, for instance, have Prometheus polars on all of the edges. And instead of running full Prometheus stacks and clustering from Prometheus and opening just thousands of network ports all over the place, um, I pulled Prometheus data centrally. I put it onto my stream, the exact same stream replication system, copies it up to where my Prometheus runs, and I express that data on a single pane of glass. I started developing many more kinds of events about um, my network, new machines starting, new machines shutting down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those goes over there so that our orchestration systems can consume it and give people a much more real-time view about what actually happens about their stuff. Metadata I mentioned. We send alerts about certain conditions over that. This could be from these orders alarms. And then on the other end, we send the stuff to Prometheus. 
We send the data to other teams. Um, we do audits on them on our, on our central database. Um, we store them in databases. We feed it into graphs. And we even notify Slack about certain things. Um, the, the, I'm at the point where we will also start doing every CLI invocation that gets done in a data center by any operator. We'll emit an event onto this, and we will have a very, very large database of compliance data that um, will show people, for instance, every command that was run on every box ever. And, and we have that for about six years, but it's not quite this nice. Um, so this technology, it's very useful. It's easy to deploy. There are really, really cool tools out there. They're open source. They're free. Um, play with it. It's very, very cool. That's me. <laughs>